And hello. Uh, so we are the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative. We are located at Plymouth State University, which is a public university in the center of New Hampshire in the US. And we are glad to have both Plymouth State folks and non-Plymouth State folks with us today to talk about the concept of academic rigor. Um, this came up when I received a query from a faculty member who said she was really enjoying some of the new project-based work that we were doing um, here at Plymouth State and some of our learning communities. We were talking about project-based learning and she had switched over from kind of an exam-based um, assessment to project-based um, learning and assessments that were based on projects. And she said her students were absolutely loving it and she felt like the learning was going great but students were saying that it wasn't as rigorous. And she was concerned because she has a reputation for being a rigorous professor. And she actually had a lot of pride about that. And she was concerned that the new approaches she was taking were not rigorous. Um, that of course got me you know, all in a tizzy about what is rigor and how do we talk about rigor? Um, and I thought maybe we would just have a conversation about it. So the plan for today is I'm actually gonna share a few slides um, probably not designed for you because you are here, um, but what they're really designed to do is to provide some of the potential pitfalls around the concept of academic rigor. So in case one or two of you have found your way in here um, and you have not heard any of the critiques of academic rigor, I'm gonna share some of those. I think we all know um, offhand some of the benefits, right? The reasons why we would want things to be rigorous. So I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the critiques of rigor. Then I'm going to ask a, um, a respondent panel of folks who work in the collab to converse um, briefly and publicly about some of the stuff that um, I talk about and some of their ideas about rigor. Um, but most of this will be at least, I think, a half an hour for you all to share your thoughts and ideas and maybe we can just have kind of a casual discussion about it. So with that, I am going to share my screen. Uh, Martha and other folks can um, monitor the chat. So feel free to be using that. I probably won't really see it. And I'm just gonna kind of steamroll through the slides um, because there's not that many of them. And I, I think it'll be quicker, but uh, don't feel, don't hesitate to log your, your ideas in there as we go or questions for later. Um, so, First of all, if you need this slide deck, um, particularly for accessibility reasons, um, there is uh, a Google deck that you can follow along with at uh, bit.ly slash death of rigor. And if you know bit.ly, you know that um, it's case sensitive, so all lowercase. Um, that will help a little bit, I think, um, for, for folks who, who need that. But also, um, we will put this in the chat at some point and give you access to this um, so you can all have that slide deck at some point. So uh, I, the other last thing I'll say about that is that in the Google Deck are all of the sources um, that I am referring to. So if you don't see the sources cited in the slide itself, it's because they're in the Google Notes. Um, underneath the deck, so you can get links to it. This is actually from a, um, a critique of rigor that we're going to talk more about, but they just quote the, the dictionary definition of rigor. And you can see already in here some reasons why educators may be given pause when thinking of the idea of, of rigor, um, not just a tremor caused by a chill, but a condition that makes life difficult, challenging, or uncomfortable. The word challenging is a word that we use positively in um, education, difficult, maybe sort of uh, um, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, uncomfortable, generally negative, and occasionally positive. Um, so some of these terms that we associate with rigor obviously have pretty negative connotations and maybe at odds with other parts of our pedagogy. Um, but some people who specifically look to rigor um, in terms of pulling it apart to see what might be problematic, um, here is an education professor at Furman, and he is uh, jumping right into some uh, terms we hear lots about, right? Grit, growth mindset, rigor. And what he's really talking about is how all of these enact um, what we call in education a deficit mindset, right? They, they um, suggest that there's a shortcoming 
particularly in the students themselves, but sometimes in the teachers or the schools, um, something that they are lacking um, that is broken in them, and this is the thing that needs to be fixed. Um, that kind of deficit approach to education is um, different than the kind of pedagogies that many of us are espousing when we are working. Um, there's an, another sort of way of thinking about some of the conflicts and the conversations about rigor. On the one hand, uh, there's a complaint that if you're not rigorous, you're actually being inequitable because you're holding people to different standards because you may not trust that they have the ability um, to succeed. So you hear that, that sometimes like high expectations are a form of respect. Um, this is actually data um, from the state of Florida where they set reading benchmarks in 2018 that were different by race. Um, and they got a lot of pushback on this um, by setting these, the benchmarks, for example, lower for African Americans than they did for whites. Um, this one is in reading in particular. Um, so people say by decreasing those expectations and a decrease in um, that there's a, a related decrease in rigor and that these actually lead to inequities. On the other side, there are people who talk about um, inequitable conditions, um, things like in standardized testing. So you may be aware of a massive lawsuit going on right now in California, um, where they've basically um, said that uh, the SAT and ACT tests um, are inequitable when it comes to class and race. Um, and therefore, California students um, should not be required to take these when they are applying to colleges. Um, this is a sort of oppositional view that says because, the, so if you hold everybody to the exact same standards, you will see that, for example, um, African American students will test lower. Um, and instead of decreasing those standards, you should actually take a look at the tests. Um, all of these are conversations in some ways um, about, about where inequity lives when you're talking about um, the challenges of rigor. Um, Donna Riley is actually uh, an engineering, um, she's an engineer, an engineering professor, and she's talking about um, rigor in the field of engineering, and she is talking about how rigor um, replicates homogenization in a disciplinary field, um, particularly along the lines um, of race, class, and gender are what she's interested in. Um, she says we have to really get rid of the idea of rigor and look for alternative ways of conceptualizing knowledge. Um, and she uses a phrase that we hear a lot in education, diverse ways of knowing. Um, an example of, uh, of diverse ways of knowing comes from Hindu Amaru Ibrahim, who's pictured here. She is a geographer who talks specifically about indigenous knowledge for climate change. Um, so she's talking about, uh, as opposed to sort of impact factor and peer reviewed science uh, of listening to indigenous communities um, and thinking about what other standards of knowledge there might be that wouldn't pass uh, standards of rigor in the academy, but may still lead to, um, to good outcomes, potentially to learning, but also to um, the public good. So the question of what counts as knowledge is part of what we talk about when we talk about, uh, about rigor and learning. Um, this is actually from a nursing professor. I, I really like tried to choose uh, some examples that were coming out of things like, you know, um, engineering and science and, and nursing. And, um, and Sandalowski is talking here about the equating of rigor with the quantitative, um, that rigor sometimes also has the tendency um, to devalue the qualitative um, and that when you get stuck in a world that sort of fetishizes or only values the quantitative that you can actually lose a fuller picture of knowledge and she's talking about that in particular in science we can imagine in nursing and in healthcare how important qualitative um, 
scientific methods are, but she says sometimes in uh, our sort of zeal to be rigorous, um, and this reminded me a lot of the professor who came seeking help from me saying, these project-based things aren't as rigorous as these multiple choice exams that I used to give where students had to pick one right correct answer. Um, so thinking about what the role of the qualitative and the quantitative might be in these conversations of rigor. Um, I wanted to throw out um, a couple of examples um, of people who are trying to reconceptualize rigor. So instead of just tossing it out, thinking instead like what, what might be a, a way of thinking um, more creatively about rigor. This comes from an article in Hybrid Pedagogy by uh, some of the folks uh, I am a fan of, um, Jesse Stommel and uh, Sean Michael Morris and um, Pete Rohrbach. Um, is that how you say it? I thought Marcia would just that jump That is right close in. enough. It's close enough, Pete, if you're well, watching. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so they are really talking about the um, relationship of play to rigor, which I think is really interesting because I think a lot of students um, and perhaps um, our student panelist will fill me in on whether I'm full of crap or, or saying the truth here, but I think sometimes students and probably faculty as well equate rigor with um, pain. Um, and so the idea of equating rigor with pleasure and with play, I found really interesting. Um, but they are interested in um, rigor as a process rather than an outcome. Um, I think it's also pretty interesting that they say they make similar arguments about community, right? Community is not a thing you can show, like a stable artifact where you can prove that you have it. It's a process in which you engage. And so they think about rigor this way as a process in which you, you engage and they're trying to situate it in a broader sense of human connection in learning, um, to put that process into relationships between people rather than in the memorization or absorption of um, difficult content. So here are the five qualities that, um, that we might think of. It's not so much networked learning, like you know, using technology and rigor. It's the idea of learning in process, in relationship. Um, so five qualities uh, to define rigor in these new ways. Uh, the first they suggest is, uh, that it's engaged, that it arises from genuine inquiry. This might be kind of like what we sometimes call authentic engagement or um, even with authentic assessments. So sometimes as, as you're trying to build rigorous assessments, um, folks like us in the collab are trying to steer you away from the rigor of like respond as lockdown proctoring browsers towards the rigor of authentic assessments that look more like the ways that you will be quote unquote tested in the work that you do in the real world after graduation. Um, they suggest that rigorous work is critical work and also self-critical work um, so that it is work that is examining itself at the same time as it's examining its content. Um, how you are doing the work is part of what makes it rigorous. Um, they equate rigor with um, curiosity, saying that it underpins the most fruitful of, of scholarly work. Um, so they are talking, I, I like that idea that, you know, instead of sort of grafting your interests as a teacher onto the students, um, they think what's where rigor really inheres is helping students to tap into that sense of inquiry and curiosity themselves, right? Because that is what will actually drive the inquiry that will power their, their knowledge, both in this situation and in the future. Um, and that it is dynamic rather than static, that it is emergent and unfolding. Um, I think it's a really interesting question where whether something that is completely static and unchanging can even be 
truly rigorous? Um, what is the role of the idea of something growing? Um, how does that relate to our concepts of rigor? Um, and what benefits might there be for learners if we thought about rigor more in this process way rather than in the mastery of content way that we're used to? Um, and this last one I think is a, a surprising term, but it's interesting once you look at it. They say that rigor is derivative. Um, and we're used to saying like, oh my God, you're so derivative. It's not really a um, positive uh, thing, but the, the way they're talking about it is really more about the relationship between scholars and scholarly work. The idea that no matter what think you are thinking, um, that think is derived from another think that you know, was thought by someone else at some point. Helping students to understand themselves as part of that scholarly conversation so that um, they understand their sources and the importance of their sources and where their information is coming from and how they're building on it. And they also feel that freedom to move it in new directions, right? So to be derivative also means you are making a new thing, right? So in order to derive something, um, you both understand your source and you move to something else. Um, so I presented that stuff not because like that's all people say about rigor, but those are some of the key bristles that the bristly people have had um, about why we shouldn't automatically believe that something that is rigorous is good for, for education. Um, two of my colleagues in the collab um, have actually written and thought pretty extensively about the idea of rigor. Um, I especially like this quote here from Martha Burtis because we mined that back from 2006, which is a super cruel thing to do to anyone to pull out a blog from 2006 and then throw it back in their faces. But that is what Martha said about rigor um, when she was really uh, basically writing a defense of rigor, um, but also trying to figure out the relationship between rigor and perfectionism and how she could be rigorous without falling into some of the traps she was identifying. Um, Matt Sheeney, some of you know, has done lots of work recently thinking about um, cruelty-free syllabi in particular. Um, and this is some of uh, the work actually from like 2019, 2020. Um, so more recent on Matt's end, where he's really been thinking about the role of things like discipline, um, rigor, and, and truthfully cruelty um, in how we structure our courses. So it seemed like a no brainer to me to ask Martha and Matt to weigh in and talk a little bit about rigor. Um, but I also wanna introduce you to one other person, which is uh, Natalie Smith. Um, Natalie also works in the collab with us, and I'm going to ask these three folks to introduce themselves briefly before they just have kind of a roundtable discussion. Um, and I will start with um, Natalie. Can you just tell us who you are and what you do in the world, Natalie? Of course. Uh, I'm Natalie. I am a second year here at PSU, currently studying accounting, uh, but I'm not sure exactly where I want to go with that. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, Matt and Martha, I'll have you introduce yourselves and then just take it away. Hi, I'm Martha Burtis. I am the learning and teaching developer here at the CoLab. So I work a lot with faculty and students um, on new approaches to thinking about teaching and learning. Matt, go for it. And I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Plymouth State. Interdisciplinary Studies is a program that allows students to create their own majors um, by bringing together elements of other majors across the university. And um, I guess we're here to talk about rigor. Um, oh. I, don't know, I don't know how you guys feel about this. Um, I would like to start with a brief defense of uh, Martha from circa 2006. Um, because I was thinking a lot about this when Robin put up the very first third first ish slide with a definition of rigor. Um, and I was reading those definitions of rigor and I was like, how could I ever have written a defense of this word. This is a horrible word. Um, except, except for this is what I love about words is that words mean so many different things, um, except for the fourth definition. I always have to go down to like the, the lower levels of, of um, the listing in, in the dictionary to get to what I'm looking for, which is strict precision or exactness. 
And I think what I was trying to talk about in my post back then was more along the lines of that kind of rigor. And I can tell you exactly where it was coming from for anybody who's interested. I was at that time working as an administrator and I was going to these meetings where we would talk about super complex um, technology issues and um, administrative uh, institutional issues. And I would come out of these meetings thinking everybody at that table was saying something different. And we all pretended that we were saying the same thing and in agreement. And we made decisions based on the, all of that not meeting up in the same place. And it was really horrifying to me. I felt like there's, there's no rigor to this conversation. We're letting ourselves off the hook. We're not really committing ourselves to, um, and I think I talk in that larger post about rigor as a commitment, as a commitment to rigor and, and drilling down into those difficult conversations. So what I've been thinking about as Robin's been talking this morning is how that, that version of me from 2006 and that understanding of that word, how that now layers into my work teaching um, and working with students. Like, is there a space in my work with students for that kind of rigor? Um, which I think is a little bit different from, from what other people might assume rigor to be based on this definition of harsh inflexibility and opinion, temper, judgment, severity, um, being unyielding or inflexible. Yes, I've been thinking about how the word itself is our problem more than the ideas, some of the ideas attached to it certainly are problematic, but um, the word is is so broad and open to unrigorous use uh, that especially when attached to big things like an entire term of a course or an entire teaching career becomes uh, almost meaningless. So while I, I like the idea and stick to the idea of rigorous thinking, rigorous experiments, rigorous analysis, um, rigorous work and rigorous curiosity even, um, when we then make the leap to applying rigor more generally, that's where certainly I feel like in my early career as a college teacher, coming to college teaching from high school teaching, um, my early career as a college teacher began with the idea that, you know, the, the thinking should be rigorous and therefore the presentation and the teaching of that thinking should uh, be in a particular way that, that I have come to see as uh, less than helpful. Um, so I've been thinking on it and I feel like as a college student, there are very two different types of rigor I've received since coming to college. I feel like there's the productive healthy rigor and I feel like I've had some classes where it's like the punishment type of rigor. And I feel like you have to, the best way to do it is in my head to rigorously think and act and analyze without having like those rigorous tests where you're examined to perfection every few weeks where you don't really learn anything you're just memorizing and that's passed off as rigor yes so what's the good kind of rigor that you've experienced do you think natalie i think good rigor in a few classes i've had great like project-based things where they want you to do so much research and present something and you have to be so analytical that you fully develop a full understanding in a way that is fun and passionate. Right. Um, that reminds me a little bit of what I was thinking about rigor as a commitment, right? As a commitment to understanding. Um, it occurred to me listening to Matt too, that it would be fun in trying to understand what the word means. What do you think the opposite of rigor is? Like mm -hmm. what word would you use as the opposite of rigor? So I have a word in my head that is not probably what, it's probably not the opposite of rigor. I think if we went and looked it up in like a, like a book that tells you the opposites of words, it would not be listed. But I'm curious to know, what do you think the opposite of rigor is, Natalie and Matt? I think immediately of squishy. Squishy, okay. Yes. Like gentle. Gentle. So I, this, this just tells, tells us so much about our different personalities. I think the opposite of rigor is laziness. <laughs> oh, <I've heard> it. <laughs> but I don't really. But only again, to go back to the, the rigor that I was chasing right. down back right. then. It was this lack of commitment to, um, to getting to the real, right? Um, 
And that felt lazy to me mm-hmm. as opposed to committed. Um, but squishy and gentle seem much more, frankly, gentle <laughs> ways of describing the opposite of rigor. Um, Robin says maybe the opposite of rigorous is, um, I don't know if she's saying that irrelevant would be the opposite or if she thinks that the opposite, like defining the opposite is irrelevant to the conversation. I'm saying your question is irrelevant. No, You're I'm saying my question is irrelevant. <laughs> I realize how that looks. No, I was just <laughs> trying to relate it to like disengagement. And then I thought, ah, maybe it's more about like, like, I don't know, things that like, can something that doesn't matter to anyone actually be rigorous? I don't know. And something that doesn't matter to anyone be rigorous. What would be something that doesn't matter to anyone? A, a spelling worksheet. A spelling worksheet. I gotcha. Right. That's really hard. Right. But nobody actually cares about it. Not, I would call it not rigorous. Not rigorous. D- even though it may have been presented as a rigorous way of assessing. Oh, Jennifer says, oh. Because oh. it's difficult. Because it's difficult. Is rigorous difficult? Is that? Um, I think Dean, some people would you see say. Dean in the chat too, he's like, we just saw, you know, four totally different definitions. It right. kind of matters right. when you're making an antonym. <laughs> right. it, does, it does matter a little bit. Yeah. I've been thinking too about rigor as an alibi, that oftentimes it becomes the word that we use mm-hmm. to justify ourselves mm-hmm. without uh, reinvestigating our oh, practice. Yeah. I think that I think that sounds very accurate. Um, I think. Oh, I was like something happened to the Zoom. I think that it, rigor is a uh, like something we can hide behind, in a way, um, rather than having the deeper, more difficult conversations about why we do what we do when we teach. Um, I think that's a trap that a lot of people fall into. Um, I wanted to, Robin talked a little bit about this inequity issue around rigor as well. And Matt, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that in your experiences, um, seeing as you feel like you've kind of traversed a a trajectory here from from where you started to where you've ended up. Um, Do you feel like any of the practices that maybe you embraced Previously, that would be determined as rigorous. Also, you chose because it felt more equitable? Yes, um, sometimes. But I think, you know, with the question of equity, what comes up for me is we know that education is distributed unevenly in all sorts of different ways. And so what kind of education is our rigor, our idea of rigor coming out of, and who's it being applied to, and who has the choice, who has the freedom to to choose that rigor and to define that rigor, um, all of which are, are questions that get into to inequities. Um, certainly when I began, I, I thought, I don't know if I thought about equity so much as I, I thought about here we are at a place where we can now, we have all chosen to be in college. We, have, we are all going to now strive for a goal that is hard to reach uh, and that striving will strengthen and educate us. Um, and I think that, that by focusing in that way and by uh, framing my idea of teaching in that particular mode, it left out the question of what a what are the pieces in place to help people reach toward those goals rather than just the setting of them. Um, And also it lacked an investigation of the inherent value and usefulness of the goals that I solely unilaterally set. Um, So I think what I worked toward was thinking about equity, not just in, in terms of Well, thinking about equity as the distribution of power within the classroom Mm -hmm. and the distribution of knowledge and authority, Um, because I realized I didn't actually want to be the authority in the classroom, even though that was the the role I was assuming, because that was what I had inherited as an Mm -hmm. idea of what a college teacher is. Mm -hmm. What I really wanted to do was create 
an environment for learning. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that the in, there's a there's a way I suppose an environment for learning can itself be rigorous. Uh, oh yeah, right. But that gets into community building within that environment. Right. What does a rigorous community look like? Yeah. Would be a, interesting. It also made as you were talking. It also made me think about the interplay between rigor and fairness. Right. And how frequently we point to rigor as a tool we use to achieve fairness. Um, and how, oh, you know, for me in the last five years or so, eight years, I've just come to the realization fairness is not real <laughs> in the way that we think it is in the classroom. And so trying to um, tool ourselves toward it almost is a, is almost a theater. It's not. Yes. It's, I was in theater is, is very right. And I say that as someone with a theater background, so I value theater as theater. Um, but right. what that's exactly what the pitfall I fell into, because as a high school teacher, I wasn't like that, partly because I also worked for nine years at a high school with a lot of students who um, had were coded with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so a third of our student population had various learning differences. So within that environment, I had learned all sorts of different ways of approaching the classroom, which I then forgot and threw out the minute I became a college teacher because of that idea, that theatrical idea of the role of the college teacher. Right. Um, so I had to sort of unlearn my own deep set assumptions about what college is and what college teachers are. Right, even after you had chosen that that was what you wanted to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Natalie, it occurs to me, I think you had, I'm thinking a little bit about this and how it plays from the continuum of high school through to college. Mm -hmm. And I think you had a non, you, didn't you have a kind of non-traditional couple of years in high school? Yes, yeah, so um, I left traditional high school at the end of my sophomore year and went to a charter school instead. Okay. Um, and did you do a bunch online? Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, I did yeah. all school work online yeah so can you talk about do you feel like there, like how would you describe how rigor played out in that part of your education was it I feel like traditional high school was a lot more rigorous in the way of sit in your box do this paper right as when you especially when you're someone who wants to learn as everyone in college is as they come here it's a lot more beneficial to be rigorous within yourself and to kind of push yourself to do the work and have that pure curiosity. Um, I think it was definitely more traditionally rigorous for non-traditional, for traditional high school. But once I switched, I found that rigor within myself. Oh, interesting. I think um, the way we had planned it was just to let this mm -hmm. sort of spill into a larger Mm -hmm. conversation. So I know these guys will continue having contributions, but I'd like to invite um, anybody who wants to participate. Um, you can obviously keep on using the chat, absolutely, but um, feel free to turn your videos on or, or leave them off um, and unmute and just jump in. We're, we're, I think, 11 of us now, so it's definitely doable to just have a conversation. Is there anybody um, new who wants to weigh in on some of this? Go ahead, Liz. Sorry, I'm not new. I'm just like, I'm just typing to myself all over the chat. Um, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to say that uh, the comment, Jennifer's comment about hearing rigor connected to integrity, that that, that seems important. I'm not exactly sure what else to say about it, although it makes me think of this idea of like academic integrity, mm -hmm. which is this other way of talking about, I think what was on one of your slides, Robin, and talked about in a more helpful way this idea of um kind of the derivation and the idea of like joining a conversation right because like if i want to charitably interpret our academic integrity policy on plagiarism and cheating right it's like okay well we want to teach like the positive spin is like this is about how to join the conversation in ethical and productive ways right but of course that's not how integrity and therefore i think the rigor and also fairness questions in academic integrity get deployed so just it seemed like i think that connection feels important to me also because it's a i guess in my head this connection between like 
what's happening in classrooms and how we design curricula, but then also policies that are sort of co-curricular. So I don't know, I just wanted to comment that I thought that word was really important, useful. Yes, and if you've ever sat on an academic integrity panel as either a student or a faculty member, you know that it does not feel particularly welcoming and uh, more, it feels much more like interrogation and punishment. Mm -hmm. All right, I have to head out and head to class. <laughs> um, uh, Natalie, thank class. you so much. We'll, we will keep chatting <laughs> a bit longer. Um, and then, you know, you can watch the remaining 15 minutes on video. <laughs> thank yeah, you so much that. and have a good class. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Judy calls. Um, yeah, so, uh, so other folks, um, feel, feel free to, um, to weigh in, I, I'm just so much of this uh, for me is also just so salient with the with the idea of policing in the academy and so tied to discipline, um, because actually the the person who was originally coming to chat with me about this was specifically also interested in the policing softwares, you know, for mm. exams. Um, not that she wanted to use them, but that she was challenge to figure out how to offer the same kinds of exams she's always offered in the past without those now that she was in an online environment. Um, and the idea that somehow those kinds of policed environments where integrity lives <laughs> are related to rigor, to academic mm -hmm. rigor. And, you know, the idea that all of that is tied up with the pun on an academic discipline is not lost on me. Um, and I just wonder, like, what, when, when, when we talk about, like, interdisciplinarity, which is such a buzzword and everybody's interested in it, I wonder how much the fears and the backlashes that sometimes come up against interdisciplinarity and territorialism and all of that stuff are related to the fact that we don't really understand what an academy looks like without discipline, without policing and without... Um, like a, a lot of, it's not just rules, it's control, right? Control. Um, Is there a way in, oh wait, um, El Bastion raised their hand. Oh, cool. I don't know I, what the L stands for. <laughs> but how's your kiddo? Is there, are they still weeping? He's, he's not, it, there's a moment of, uh, there's a pause. <laughs> We're all like cloistered in the same smoky room here. Oh. Uh, uh, so but my name is Laurel. I'm, uh, I'm actually, if I'm, I think Robin, you know Steel Wagstaff. Yes. So, um, so I, I, thanks for posting this. So I, I missed the first, the first 15 minutes uh, and I'm having an errant thought that may not plug in directly, but I'm thinking along with what you're describing, Robert, Ro uh, Robin, about the um, piece around rigor and integrity that's also attached to school ratings, to um, the kind of right, to, to how schools sell themselves. And part of the reason I'm thinking about that is because our um, UO Online, the University of Oregon Online, uh, is attending a workshop that is coming up about preserving academic integrity. And I think the rigor is part of that and all of the language of that workshop is around preserving that integrity, basically, so students, uh, schools can, at least reading between the lines, keep their brand intact and continue making that money. So I don't have something clear to say about that, but I'm thinking about how, how that might, um, how, the, how the, f the funding and the control go together in, in some versions of rigor that are totally different than what Natalie was sharing. And, and the rigor she was sharing about, of course, was rigor that was student driven and, and, I, and I loved thinking about that as she described it. Yeah, I was just about to ask to what degree people feel like their institutions wield rigor as almost a weapon in conversations that, you know, this is hold it up as an ideal that then certain practices or certain progressive um, acts in the classroom are seen as anti-rigor and therefore anti-institution 
I, I mean, my perspective is from having done faculty development for so many years, the number of times I've been in conversations where I've, sh I've shared an idea or a practice or um, with somebody and the, the subtext, it's very rarely does somebody come out and say this to my face, but the subtext that I'll get is, well, that's all well and good, but it's, it's not really rigorous. Like that's, that's not how I teach. It's not rigorous enough. That's not what our institution stands for. I'm not really talking about PSU. I haven't been here that long. But for those of you who have or at your own institutions, do you feel like rigor is something that the institution um, is 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 woven into the fabric of the institution in such a way that it makes it difficult to to maybe move in other pedagogical directions? And I don't know the answer to that. I'm just curious. Maybe maybe I'm the only one who's curious about that. I, so I will say one other thing that my my high this is one of the reasons I wanted to hear about Natalie's experience with high schools. I went to this this high school in Virginia that that was a magnet school that you had to apply to get into. It's it's incredibly difficult to get into now, and I'm I'm part of the alumni groups on Facebook, and they're going through a complete. Um, kind of overhaul of the, they're trying to go through a complete overhaul of the admissions um, for this high school because something like only, I don't think any students, any black students were admitted this, this cycle for the, for the school. Um, and it's, it's incredibly complicated because in the years since I've left, the racial mix of the school has shifted primarily to um, Asian American students. It's almost 80% Asian American students now. Um, the rest are basically white. And then there's a small number of Latinx and, and, and black students at the school and other races. And um, so they're trying to fix this with the admissions and the backlash almost entirely has been people saying we're kind of de-rigifying admissions to Jefferson, that we were rigorous and what this will do is turn us into an unrigorous school and that that's what we've always stood for. Um, and it's really interesting to watch from the sidelines of this because what's, there's a lot coded in that word um, when they're using it that way that nobody really wants to necessarily address or come out and say, and it's tied up, like I said, into the fabric and the identity of the institution. I experienced that very much at, at the last high school I worked at for one year where uh, I had arrived after a few years after a new principal who had opened up their selections um, and uh, allowed in students who previously would not have been allowed in. And that was hugely controversial with the older faculty and alumni because they felt like it had watered down and ruined the school to have people, um, to, to have a more diverse student body allowed in. It yeah. Was an extraordinary experience. It's, in our instance, what's really interesting, at least in the circles that I'm in, it, the pushback is not from alumni. Alumni are actually pushing for this change the pushback is from the parents of current students. Yes, because the diploma once meant something and now yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are experiencing it right now and what they see as a loss, you know, of, of status for themselves and their students, their children. Um, but it definitely feels like in the admissions, um, in, the, in the admissions process, very often rigor is held up as an, as an ideal for an institution. I mean, and in addition to all of this sort of inherent like racism and classism in all of this stuff, I think, you know, this is what like in the slide deck Riley and Abraham sort of talk and work on, you know, like what are the effects on knowledge and therefore on the public good when you're basically setting your standards of achievement by matching right by um a replication right yeah which is sort of i mean the word stat the phrase status quo becomes so resonant here and you're not just talking about status quo in sort of the demographics of your institution you're talking about status quo in knowledge which is sort of like anti-rigorous i think it goes back to what those other folks are talking about why dynamism and process becomes right. so important because otherwise you don't have the ability to grow knowledge you know right. so that's the part that um you know i have a, a high schooler who is 
involved in some online learning in these competency-based curricula that are uh, mastery-based. And, um, you know, how much do I say in a recorded thing? But mm -hmm. it's not very hard to game the system on these mastery-based things that think they are very rigorous, you know, because they are forcing you to memorize like every bone in the body, which can easily be found <laughs> in like, many places. Um, so, I also just, when I look at that, like any, any sixth grader can see how easy it is to gain the rigor when the rigor is regurgitative like that, you know? And so it's not just the effects on like people's lived experiences, it's also the effect on knowledge, which, you know, right now is no secret that whatever happens in our knowledge communities is gonna have a pretty direct impact on say public health, for example, it's just one example, right? So I definitely think um, regurgitation. Yeah, so in the chat, there has been um, rigor and I can't even regurgitation. Regurgitation. <laughs> anyway, um, we'll take a couple more comments if people want. And then I also think it's not a bad idea to end just a few minutes before noon because all of your next Zooms probably start at noon. Um, Liz, I'll a few minutes before one. One. Oh no, we're gonna go back in time. Oh, can we go back to 2019? Your free hour. No, yeah, before one. I thought you were raising your hand. You know, I haven't learned the time travel function in Zoom though. That's a very oh God, cool I was option. Just talking about time travel yesterday with who? Martha? Someone? Oh yeah, probably me. I talk yeah, about it all Martha the time these days. People, I'm not even gonna get into it. This <laughs> might be a time for ending. It's Does not very rigorous. Have, Does anybody have any? Parting comments or questions they want to throw out to anybody want to defend rigor? I just like right now the rubber's finally hitting the road. Like I think it, my composition students have spent a lot of time for various reasons. I'm not blaming them for this. Not believing the ungrading. Mm -hmm. Like just straight up, like like it, it washes past them because mm -hmm. it's so. I think just strange. Mm -hmm. And I've had more than one conversation with students who are like. I mean, essential, I'm paraphrasing a bit, who are like, <laughs> it's your job mm -hmm. to Great. sort and rank me. Yes, I know. Like, like it's your job uh -huh. to deduct points so I won't <laughs> hand in things late. And I'm like, what am I paying you for? Right? Right. <laughs> it's just, I'm just, I'm, I'm mentioning it only like not because I, you know, I'm, I, not because I didn't expect it even, not because it hasn't happened before, but it's just like literally what's happening this week in comp. Mm -hmm. It's like suddenly they're like, but, but, oh God, I'm so sorry I handed this in late. I'm like, okay, like just hand it, you know, and this disbelief, this learned disbelief. And it's that not brings me to like, to that whole other thing too about, I think maybe Matt, somebody mentioned this about what, yeah. Yes, Matt, about what you perceive as rigor in your own job as a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if I am not killing myself with grading and wanting to die at any every moment because I am so depressed at the stacks of work that I have to do, then I'm not doing my job, right? Which is a, a thing people also face when, when they ungrade in certain ways. Um, so yeah, that... that yeah, go ahead, Martha. I will say similar to Liz's experience, I am currently homeschooling a seventh grader who, um, like the first week of homeschooling, I assigned this video to him and he asked me a question about it. And I was like, I don't know, I haven't watched it. And he was like, what do you mean you haven't watched it? You're my teacher. I was like, I I'm not a seventh grade teacher. Um, like, I I'm having to like, uns I mean, unschooling is a whole thing, but like, it is so fascinating. This is a kid who like curiosity drips out of him, but as soon as we're in school mode, he gets so agitated and anxious and having to kind of retune him to like today, he only got half of one thing done because he was really struggling with it. He was so down on himself at the end. And I was like, kid, we're homeschooling. Like, there's no grade. Nobody's going to get in trouble. We'll just pick up where we left off tomorrow. Um, it's just really, really interesting how deeply ingrained that is in our students. And to them, that's probably rigor, you know. Um, I just want to say thank you for this. I, I, I don't want to say I thought about canceling this, but there were moments where I looked at my calendar and I thought, the world is on fire. 
why are we talking about this right now? Um, but I think it's really helpful, at least to me psychologically, to pause with some of the other really urgent concerns that are happening and just check in as teachers um, and build some connections across our practices. So I want to thank you so much for coming. Um, this recording will be available on the CoLab website probably in a couple of days. Um, we'll make a little resource that'll also have the slide deck. Um, so if you can't find that, you can just ping me somewhere um, and check our events calendar again on the CoLab website for more stuff that's coming up. And thank you to everybody who came and we will stop recording now. Martha. <laughs>